Hello and welcome to our Principal Chairs Q&A live stream with Elizabeth Rowe. Um, Elizabeth is Principal Flute of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, faculty member of the New England Conservatory of Music and Equal Rights Advocate. Welcome Elizabeth. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just delighted to be here. Well, thank you for being with us. Um, we've had, we have so many fantastic questions have been for you today. Um, so I'm sure we'll have a great live stream for you tonight. Um, our first question is from Jolene and she asks, um, she says, I'd love to know what type of exercises constitute your warm up or fun fundamentals routine? That's a great question, Jolene. And um, I am going to answer this in two different ways. So I'm at the point in my career where I change my daily warm ups and routines quite a lot based on what I sense I need in my playing. So sometimes I feel like I need extra attention on my sound. Sometimes I feel like my fingers are getting a little clunky. So I mix it up quite a lot. Um, some of my favorites are um, the Moise 24 Petite Melodies. I love working on those for sound and flexibility. Um, if I can play those well first thing in the day, I think I'm ready to go. <laughs> um, so I'm likely to do something like that. I sometimes will throw in a vibrato exercise. I might do some scales. Um, sometimes I work on articulation depending on what I need to do, um, but I keep it pretty varied. Um, for, for at earlier times in my career, I had a more structured regimen where I would do long tones, scales, flexibility exercises like harmonics um, to keep my embouchure flexible and supple um, and articulation exercises, that sort of thing. But I've always played those Moise Petite Melodies. I have the copy of that that I bought when I was eight years old and I still carry it with me in my <laughs> flute bag. Brilliant. Um, I haven't played those for a while actually, so I might go back to those soon. <laughs> I think they're hard to play them beautifully. They're so simple. Uh, it just it takes everything you got to do it to do it really well. Thank you for that question, Jolene. Um, we have a question from Millie. She says, "I've heard that you are very active in supporting young professionals in the industry. Could you tell us about your projects in this area?" I would love to. Um, so I have been a flute teacher for my whole career. I in fact, was teaching when I was in high school and through college and, and since then. But in the last decade or so, I've noticed that I've had an, a special connection to musicians who are kind of in the very early part of their professional lives, usually the decade right after music school. It's a time with so many opportunities, but also challenges, trying to figure out what you want for your career, what you want for your personal life, how to navigate you know, all the choices and opportunities and questions um, that come up during that time. So I have mentored a lot of musicians at that phase of their career. And during this pandemic, at the start of the pandemic, I was looking for a way to create a little bit more community in our industry. And so I formed a private Facebook group specifically for those musicians, for musicians in that demographic, in that age group. And I don't know anything about, or I didn't know anything about Facebook or social media or anything. I was terrible at it. <laughs> but so I've, so I've, I've created this community and I should say more accurately that they have created this community um, on Facebook, which is really designed to make it okay to be a three-dimensional person, not just a musician, to talk about the things that we are confused about or scared about or wonder about that sometimes we don't feel like we can talk about when we're trying to put on our perfect professional mm. selves when we're performing. Um, to, so we've created real, a real safe space to just talk about the things that often don't get discussed. So um, that's something that I feel really uh, grateful to be part of. Um, and I also have a few other projects going. I'm, I'm working on actually building a program to help musicians 
get through the tenure process in their orchestra jobs, which is a really challenging process, at least in um, U.S. orchestras. We it's a, it can be a very daunting process. So I'm I'm working on creating a program to help musicians with that too. So these are the things that I that I really that I love that really energize me and make me feel really proud to be a musician. Mm. And how is that um, project for the tenure musicians? How is that being instigated? Is that so? Is that online as well, or is that so? That I'm still working on developing. I I don't think I don't think it's going to be online. It's a very it's a very delicate process. Um, I'm I'm conceiving of some sort of a very small group that would almost serve as a team, and mm -hmm. um, where we could work together. I could support them in their uh, individual situations and then we could also come together to provide some support and some encouragement and some commiseration as we all you know walk through that process so i haven't finished developing it really it's a it's a new fresh idea for me so i'm, I'm looking forward to getting that rolling and i don't know in the next month or two i have to just think really carefully about the best way to support these these players mm. brilliant that's a really interesting subject actually um, and it sounds like you've sort of got a unique way of addressing these challenges for young people. So thank you. <laughs> That's a great um, question too. Um, we have a question from Arthur. He says, would you say there is a distinctly American style of flute playing? And if so, what would you say are its characteristics? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Arthur, I think that, um, you know, the world has gotten so much more, you know, the world has gotten smaller in a way, right? So we're, it's, we're so much more global. Um, and of course we have a French tradition at the root of a lot of American flute playing. Um, I'm not sure that I would say that there's a distinctive American style of, of flute playing. Um, I, I think that there is a distinctive traditional American style of orchestral flute playing. Um, and that is one of a lot of blend and consensus within the wind section, um, so that there's a lot of um, a sense of collective phrasing and um, blending of sounds and interweaving of our, our individual personalities into something that has a lot of uh, unity as a, as a section. I think that um, there are other styles of orchestral playing that are more in individualistic that each independent uh, musician has more of a kind of a soloistic approach and while we do play soloistically we also have a, a, a we prioritize a certain amount of blend and and coherence within the the wind section so if there were something that were traditionally american i would say that that would be it mm -hmm. fantastic um, I should mention also that anyone who's watching, please do comment your questions below on the Facebook video and um, we'll see those live questions and then hopefully we'll have time for Elizabeth to get through all of the questions that we've got tonight. So please send in more questions still. Um, in the meantime, we have another question from Arthur and he says, do you feel the beauty and wonderful acoustic of Boston Symphony Hall affect the way the orchestra plays? What do you think encourages it? Are there any downsides? That's a great question. And the answer is a wholehearted yes, that the acoustics of Symphony Hall are tremendously important to the way we play. It has shaped the sound of this orchestra since, since the very beginning. I mean, we have been privileged to be in this incredible, incredible uh, performance hall that we own. And it has shaped the sound of the Boston Symphony since its inception, essentially. And um, I think that it more than almost anything else is responsible for how we play. Um, it's a very live hall. It's a very warm hall. It rewards subtlety, nuance, delicacy. It rewards transparency. I remember when I auditioned for my position with the Boston Symphony, I remember playing Afternoon of a Fawn mm -hmm. in my audition, standing alone on that stage and just recognizing the the world of acoustical color that was available to me because of being on symphony hall stage because of the you know the, the kind of pale translucent colors that i could access because of that acoustic it was just extraordinary and so if you asked any member of the orchestra they would agree that it's 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 our, our most prized asset in, in a way and 
nobody will complain about Symphony Hall. There, the, occasionally, because of the amount, the, how live it is, it can be hard to hear with clarity. And we'll travel to Carnegie Hall, for example, in New York City, and all of a sudden I'll think, oh my goodness, I can hear the basses in this one section, and I had no idea. <laughs> so sometimes we do enjoy being in other acoustics that allow us to hear a little bit better, but we feel absolutely privileged to play on Symphony Hall. Mm -hmm. Do you travel to other halls very often or is most of your work at Symphony Hall? We are in in normal times, <laughs> not during not during COVID. We we play our full winter season, which runs approximately September through you know June at Symphony Hall. Um, we tend to take at least I would say on average one international tour per year. It might be a two to three week festivals tour in Europe at the end of the summer. Um, we might go to Asia for a couple of weeks um, in the spring. Um, we tend to go on a two to three week tour once once a year. And we also relocate for our summer season and we spend eight full weeks out in the Berkshires at Tanglewood in Western Massachusetts where we pay, play a full eight week summer season out mm -hmm. there. That's a different style of season for us. We put on three completely different full classical pro programs per week for eight weeks. So mm -hmm. it's it's intense. It's pretty it's pretty <laughs> spectacular. Mm -hmm. And while you're at Tanglewood, do you? Um, I I mean I don't know very much about it being from the UK, but that's with the the summer courses at Tanglewood as well, isn't it? And are you involved um, with the teaching as well? Yes, it's the, the Tangwood Music Center or TMC is what we what we um, call it. And yes, so it's a very um, uh, elite kind of college level summer music festival that runs for eight weeks. Um, and the Boston Symphony is very involved in it. So we are we make up the majority of the faculty that that works with the students there. Um, I, I, I hesitate to even call them students because they're really young, young professionals. But um, and I um, uh, the I forget what the title is, but but I'm I run the flute program there basically. So, um, but my colleagues in the flute section of the Boston Symphony also teach. So we all work with the the flute players there, which is I love it. It's a it's just a, a an incredibly always an incredibly talented group of players, and it's just a wonderful musical environment to spend time with them. Mm. Um, we have we have um, some similar programs possibly, well, I think they're quite similar in the UK, but I don't think we have anything that's quite such um, an intense program for so long, because you say it's for eight weeks. Is, is that right? So that's a That sounds like a very long time to be so intensely immersed for a young professional, but it sounds amazing. It is amazing. I was a student there myself um, right after my undergrad, so I experienced it on both sides of the, of the equation. It is very intense, um, but it's it's really wonderful. We, um, the the Tanglewood fellows are give are given the chance to sit on stage with us for rehearsals on occasion, so that they can kind of feel what it feels like to sit in the middle of a wind section in the Boston Symphony. And um, they put on a whole series of chamber music and orchestral performances with lots of really really um, substantial international conductors and guest artists and soloists. So it's it's pretty great. Fantastic. We've just had a live question in from Elsa and she says, hello, since most of the orchestra concerts are cancelled in the USA now, what have you been up to to keep your playing going? That's a great question, Elsa, and it's a question that we have, um, I've been so interested to talk to my colleagues to find out what their answers have been to this too. So. Um, my answer to the question has shifted depending on what month I've been in and where we were in the in the pandemic. Um, right now, actually, the Boston Symphony is back to work for no with no audience. Um, we are making video productions of some performances. Um, we're being tested and observing all the distancing protocols, and um, so so right now, I actually do have work, um, and I'm able to go to work under very unusual and different circumstances than normal, but that is definitely there right now. In the past um, several months, I have gone through waves of um, feeling inspired to practice and times when I have 
either not been inspired or have intentionally wanted to give myself a little bit of a break. I haven't really not been under the spotlight for decades now. So for me, being able to step out of the spotlight a little bit was a, a welcome, a welcome relief. But I know that that is because I'm in a very privileged place to start with. So um, I actually found some inspiration earlier in the summer when I was asked to record a piece for another Boston Symphony project. And I learned, I discovered and learned a piece by this composer, Alison Loggins Hull, who's a wonderful flutist and composer. She's part of a duo called Flutronics that are, they're flutists and composers. Um, and she wrote this extraordinary piece called Homeland for flute alone. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's about a lot of things, but it's about the idea of belonging and what it's like to live somewhere where you don't feel at home. Um, and this piece, I performed this piece kind of right at the, in the middle of the social justice, racial justice movement that's been going on in this country. And to be able to perform a piece that I loved and that also felt relevant to current times was a way for me to gain a different kind of inspiration and motivation, which I found really powerful. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you for that question, Elsa. Um, we have a question from Beth um, that was sent in earlier, and she asks, when hearing about your gender discrimination lawsuit, I was inspired by your commitment to an important issue. What do you think we can all do to proactively change the industry and rebalance the gender inequality? That's a great question and a big question. Um, <laughs> I think we have a lot of work to do both in, I mean, to address issues of equity in our industry around both gender and racial lines. And I think that part of what is starting to happen that really gives me a lot of hope is that the conversations are starting, which is something that we didn't have or not enough of, or certainly not in enough of the public sphere um, until relatively recently. Um, so that's, you know, just even this question coming up is new. Um, so this is great. I think that we need to have a really honest conversation about transparency around pay, especially in the United States. These things are still very mysterious. They're secretive. Um, we often don't know a lot um, about how corporations or orchestras pay and compensate and why. So, a, a really important first step to addressing any kind of problem is to just identify it at first and to know what you're looking at. So that's a really important step that we haven't yet come to terms with in our in our industry. Um, I think that could go a long way. So pay transparency. Um, I think we also need to think about auditions and the notion of blind auditions that we are very proud of in this country, but to acknowledge the reality that most auditions actually aren't blind, that the screen comes down at a certain point in the process. Um, and at that point, we can't claim that it's a mm. blind audition. So, so to, to start having a more nuanced conversation about what, what we actually mean by a blind audition, what is impartiality? It's a difficult conversation in an industry where, you know, a lot of our judgments are subjective. We we don't measure people based on sales numbers or, you know, some other kind of like mathematical calculation. So we're talking about subjective measurements of people's value and worth, and um, it's complicated. But um, I think if we can shine a light on what current practices are and then start asking really important questions, I think we will start to make a lot of progress. I also think it's important that we recognize that most of us are trained as musicians and we are not trained in um, hiring practices, in discrimination, in, I mean, not in, in, in addressing discrimination, we're not trained in all of these things. And it is really important that we bring in experts, people who have expertise and who have knowledge in these areas to help us. Um, so. Mm. Brilliant, thank you for that question, Beth. That's a really interesting topic. Um, we have another question has been sent in by Ron and he says, I met one of your legendary predecessors, Dor um, Doriot Anthony Dwyer, a number of times because my parents knew her from their time at the Eastman School of Music. 
Do you ever dabble in jazz flute? I know that Doria was fond of Jeremy Stieg's jazz flute playing. Doria was a, was a trailblazer. She was an incredible woman and um, she was absolutely one of a kind. Um, and I, <laughs> Not only do I not play jazz flute, I also, I studied with someone who plays jazz flute. I studied with Jimmy Walker, um, who plays jazz. And I I regret that I have no talent <laughs> or ability to do that. And I absolutely do not. So I, I, I admire anybody who can, and uh, my hat's off to you. <laughs> Dorit was the, um, was she the previous female principal? Is that correct? Yeah, she was the first female principal player um, in a major orchestra in this country. She was the first female principal player in the Boston Symphony. Um, she was hired in 1952, um, and that was right at the advent of the screened auditions. Um, and so she was a re she was a real trailblazer, and she stayed in that chair for well over three decades, um, and was really a um, a unique a unique presence in our in our in the history of this orchestra in, in the Boston Symphony. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for that. We have a question from Millie. She says, you clearly have a very varied career. Can you tell us a little about your work outside of the orchestra? Thanks, Millie, that's a great question. Um, yeah, one of the things that I am really interested in is um, both acknowledging and supporting the ways in which musicians are more than just musicians. Um, I think it's so easy for all of us because we are so singularly focused on this craft and this art form, especially when we are younger, to um, have it be our entire life, and which is a natural thing to happen when you are in conservatory and you are training and that's kind of your primary goal. But as life goes on, you know, we end up with, you know, other people that we want to be with. We have families, we have other interests, we have um, other avenues that we want to place our creativity into. And I think that that's really healthy for musicians. And I think that actually it's something that we should encourage earlier in our training because, you know, we've all realized during this pandemic that when, if everything you have going is in one area of your life it doesn't really matter what it is when that shuts down and if there's nothing left there to kind of fill those gaps it can be really terrifying so I have um along with my performing and teaching um I've I've been doing a lot of mentorship work which we had talked about uh before um and I have also begun um working as a professional coach which coaching is a sort of a form of partnership where you help people work on their personal goals, their professional goals, you help them get some clarity on what they want and learn how to take steps and think think more clearly about how to get there. So it's just a really lovely supportive um, partnership. And it's something that I um, have experienced myself. I Part of the reason that I had the inspiration to start this Facebook group for these early professional musicians is because I was working with a coach and mm -hmm. she helped me kind of tap into the the aspects of of, of of my life that were inspiring to me, giving me joy and and giving me purpose, even when my primary thing, playing in the Boston Symphony, had disappeared. And so um, so I also do this work now to help people get clarity about ways that they can make their lives more satisfying and fulfilling and move forward on their goals, professional goals, personal goals. So um, it's been really wonderful for me to find other ways to support people and help people, challenge people, um, not just on, you know, that F sharp is out of tune, which I also do. <laughs> but it, to me, it's, it's just a different kind, it's a different form of work. I enjoy it quite a lot. Fantastic. Um... That's a great question, Millie. Um, and one from Rob now. Um, what was your audition process like for the Boston Symphony Orchestra and how did you prepare for it? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so this 
this position in the Boston Symphony, the principal flute chair in the Boston Symphony had a lot of notoriety in, in the United States. It had, after Dorio retired, um, the chair, the position went unfilled for something like a, eight years or a decade. They, they, they couldn't find anybody, couldn't hire anybody, um, just weren't able to find somebody that they thought was right for the position. It became a little bit notorious. Um, and then the really wonderful European flutist Jacques Zun came and um, was hired and he played for about five years, I believe, as principal flute. Um, and then he left and then the position was open for a few years again. There was a music director change, there was a bunch of stuff. So it, this position had been kind of uh, open and, and uh, like I said, a little bit notorious for, for the better part of my adult career. Um, I had sort of grown up hearing about it and then, you know, watched these various uh, vacancies happen. And so I was pretty well established in my career. I had been, I played in a couple of different orchestras and I was in the National Symphony at the time that this audition was advertised. And um, I was 29 and I was pretty happy. I had, I was I was and still am married to a violinist. Um, he was a member of the National Symphony. We had just bought a house. We were, you know, pretty much figuring that that was it, that we were going to stay there. And I love living in Washington, D.C. And um, then this position was advertised. And I thought to myself, well, I thought two things. First of all, they're never going to hire anybody because that's what happens <laughs> <laughs> with this. And and if I don't take this audition, I think I'll always regret not trying. So I decided that I was going to just pour my heart and soul into it and um, take the audition and um, just put everything I had into it. And then I just figured they weren't going to hire anybody or if they did, it probably would be me. And so that would be the end of that. Um, so um, I, I flew to Boston. It was incredible. It was in January. It was incredibly cold. It was some five below zero of like freezing crazy conditions. And um played a number of rounds um, in that glorious symphony hall and just loved every second of playing in there. And I, I, I played, I played my heart out and, um, and they narrowed it down to, to, I think there were three of us in the super finals or I forget how it went, but then we um, were asked to stay another day and play chamber music um, as sort of the, final, 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 final round. And uh, so I remember being really relieved to put away my giant stack of orchestral repertoire and just focus on the Mozart D major flute quartet, which I love. And um, we played that as our very final round um, of the audition. And um, and then they came out and announced that I was the winner. And, and uh, I was, you know, <laughs> thrilled and stunned and, you know. <laughs> Uh, so, so, but it was a, it was a very by the books audition in the sense that, you know, they started with 300 and something candidates and, um, ran it, you know, straight through. It was not a, um, special audition or it wasn't a kind of invitation only kind of situation. Like we all went through the process and, um, and then I ended up at the end. So. That's amazing. So how many rounds were there and how many days did it take? <sighs> I think so. I um, I started. I skipped the preliminary round, so I was advanced because of my position that I'd been in before to the semifinals. So I suspect that there was one day of prelims. Now that I've sat on a, a number of committees in the Boston mm -hmm. Symphony, just thinking of how we schedule them, my 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 guess is that there was one day of prelims, um, and then there was the second day where I came and played semifinals where there might've been 15 of us in that round, I think. And then I think they reduced it to, gosh, I can't remember now. Mm -hmm. I think they reduced it to four or five and then to three. There might've been yet another round. I'm not sure. So, and I actually can't remember if it was over one day or two days. Isn't this terrible? <laughs> it's all one big blur. Um, and then I had to stay an additional day. I remember I think I had to change my flight because I was supposed to fly home and they asked us to stay an additional day to do the chamber music. So um, 
This is terrible that I can't remember it more clearly. I have to go back and look at my calendar to find out what it was. <laughs> It sounds, um, I just asked actually, because it sounds quite different from UK auditions. Um, I, I, I presume that's relatively normal for an American audition, but to, to have that many rounds and over more than one day is quite unusual in the UK. Usually, I don't, I've never heard of there ever being more than two rounds um, in the ah. UK. But they also don't invite everybody for an audition. So there's no <laughs> audition, if you still what I mean. So maybe that. Yes. Well, in, in 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 here we also don't invite everyone. We we accept resumes from anybody who wishes to send them in, and then there's usually a pre-screening round, which is done by recording, um, oh, okay. audio recording, mm -hmm. and then from there you are invited either to the preliminary round. So Boston Symphony does every orchestra in the U.S. does it differently, but but Boston Symphony um, tends to have about forty people in the prelims, and they tend to do that in one day. Okay. And then there'll there'll be a semifinal round that will be made up of those who advanced from the prelims, but also often a handful of invited players who are already in major positions, um, so that they're brought in at that point. But it all remains screened. At least everyone, at least in the Boston Symphony, has to advance past at least one round that is screened mm -hmm. before you reach the point at which the screen is removed. So there's at least um, some point at which you have to anonymously get yeah. through to the next round. Brilliant. Uh, thank you for that question, Rob. Uh, we have a question from Robin, who says, I loved your TED talk. I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could tell us any more about what was discussed in the meeting that you had with other young professionals, which you mentioned in your speech. Thank you. Thanks for the um, comment about the TED talk. That was a, that was a, a very, um, challenging and powerful experience for me to, to deliver that. Um, yes, so one of the really meaningful experiences that I had um, in terms of learning a little bit more about the ways in which we're all connected to each other and thinking both um, outside of the box in terms of thinking about finding connections with people who maybe aren't musicians or people who do different things but understanding our common humanity but also really importantly for me is seeing the the really important connections that can be created between generations in the same industry or between leaders and new emerging professionals and so there was a a really wonderful um conversation that happened with some young um women musicians and um that they had asked to meet with a group of older women musicians that were more experienced and really to talk about um, some of the challenges that we face as women in the industry and some of the difficult experiences that they had already confronted even in their early to mid twenties. And, um, and I, you know, one of the things that was really important for me that I realized in the course of that conversation was that I think that they had had, many of them had had an idea that we more um, experienced professionals kind of had the answers to everything and we had it all figured out and we were very polished and we kind of had a lot of confidence and assuredness and we knew what we were doing. And it was really important for me that they knew that that wasn't the case, that we struggle with a lot of the same things, that we still get startled by experiences that we might have, that we don't always know how to handle things, that we have doubts that we doubt ourselves. And I don't mean we meaning women, but we meaning accomplished professionals. Um, we wonder about whether we belong in our jobs. We have moments where we question our choices. We have moments of insecurity and fear and doubt as much as we have moments of joy and exhilaration and all of that. And it, it became really clear to me that the most valuable thing that that I could share with these younger musicians really wasn't some kind of expert guidance or expert, you know, um, sort of teacherly kind of information, but it was really that human to human empathy and understanding that we all had had very similar experiences and that um, I think it just helps everybody feel better when they feel like they're not so alone. Mm -hmm. So did you say this was instigated by the young professionals, this meeting? Mm -hmm. 
And that's something that I, um, when you and I were just speaking briefly before we, we went live, um, we were talking about this talk that I gave at the Eastman School of Music, which was, they had held a conference on gender equity in music. And that day at Eastman was largely generated by the students. The idea of it was was generated by the students. And um, I have had more remarkable experiences in the last few years of really transformative conversations in our industry that were really absolutely generated by these I, I keep using the word younger or young, but it's I'm talking about early professionals, you know, musicians in their in their early to mid twenties or late twenties who are the next generation of people entering into the industry who are starting these really important conversations. And it's it gives me just tremendous hope and inspiration to to see that kind of leadership emerge. Yeah. Ashley, could you talk any more about that um day at the Eastman School that you mentioned? Because I watched your the video is still online, actually, if anyone wants to watch this. It's a really interesting speech by Elizabeth. But if you'd like to kind of summarize what happened on the day, that would be great. Oh, yes, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, it was a day long event. It was a conference um, where the pretty much the whole school shut down to the point that they were able to release students from their classes and rehearsals to be able to attend various um, panel discussions. Um, so there was panel discussions about intersectionality, about, you know, race and gender. Um, there was, um, there were really interesting, there, so it was basically a series of panel discussions all day long, um, led by many times by students, many times a combination of students and faculty talking about the some of the challenges that exist in the music world around um, the power dynamics between teachers and students and how that can sometimes become trouble troublesome or problematic. Um, you know, we've had our own challenges in the music industry just like everyone else has around inappropriate relationships between teachers and students or between people in positions of power and others. And um, so really provocative conversations about that. Um, very interesting um, guest speakers. A There was a non-binary opera singer who came to share with us their experience about existing in a very kind of gendered <laughs> world and especially in the performance area of, of opera and, and the ways in which that that experience had had the, the way that they were navigating that experience um and i started the day with a 45 minute um keynote address talking about um some just variety of thoughts and observations about where we were in the industry and where we can go and it was just a, an exciting day and it was exciting to see something like this happen and to see um the kind of energy and the kind of enthusiasm and creativity and passion really that was driving all of these uh, Eastman School students to create something like this and make space for these conversations to happen, which circles back to that earlier question we were talking about today about what are some of the steps we can take in our industry. And, you know, something like that is, is huge. These are conversations that we weren't having a couple of years ago, at least not in a publicly sanctioned forum like a conference on gender equity and music happening at a prestigious music conservatory. That's really fantastic. Hopefully that sort of paves the way for similar things happening in other conservatoires so that it becomes the norm for us to talk about this. Um, just to remind us, anybody watching, please do send in any live questions you have um, because Elizabeth can answer anything that you comment below on the Facebook video. Um, in the meantime, we have another question from Robin. And he says, you've recorded many wonderful CDs with the Boston Symphony chamber players. Do you have a different mentality or approach to playing for a recording compared to playing in a concert? That's a great question. And I actually wished I had asked myself that question a while back because the answer is I should have a different <laughs> mentality. Um, and it's taken me a long time to learn that. I have never been a recording artist um, in the sense that I, um, when I have made recordings, they have tended to have happened accidentally or um, as a byproduct of a, la a live performance. Um, uh, Boston Symphony has a recording of uh, Ravel, Daphnis, and Chloe that we released, and I'm playing the flute solo, and I had 
no idea that we were recording it. It was just <laughs> one night they recorded it randomly and then they put it out as a CD. And I was just, <laughs> I, was, I, it, I had absolutely no idea. So, um, so, so I have learned that the way I play for a live audience in a large space doesn't necessarily translate well to a microphone. Um, I play big um, with some rough edges that are that disappear 10, 15 feet out into the into mm. the atmosphere. Um, there's a certain kind of scale of things. It's a little more untidy. It's a little more. Um, uh, I guess there's just there's just a little bit of roughness about it, which adds to the beauty out into the hall. So if things are too perfect and polished and, and, and super precise up close, then sometimes it can feel a little small or closed off by the time the sound really gets out into the hall. So, um, however, when you have a microphone right there, then you actually do need to rein it in and pull your sound together a little bit more and play with a little cleaner edges and a little bit less of the kind of oversized, um approach so i'm still learning how to do that um and learning how to switch gears and actually the work that we're doing right now with the boston symphony is kind of the strange hybrid of i mean we're essentially becoming a studio recording orchestra because we're not playing for an audience and we're playing for video cameras um, and so i also have had i'm having this interesting experience of not because we're spread out so far on stage for safety reasons. I don't have that sense, back to that other question too about American style playing, orchestral playing, that sense of my colleagues right shoulder to shoulder with me and the idea of the blend that we kind of get where we, like one ear is attached to the other person's ear almost. It's different now because we're 10 feet apart. So I am able to hear myself a little bit better. I'm trying to pull my sound in a little bit to play a little bit more for the, for the, for the microphone. It's not first nature to me. It's, it's it's a little uncomfortable for me. So I'm trying not to overthink it because I just do want to be myself. So um, it's a work in progress, I guess. My answer <laughs> to your question is sometimes, and it depends, and I'm trying. <laughs> and do you think with that recording that you mentioned of Daphnis, do you think you'd play differently if you knew it was going to be recorded for, C for a CD or would you feel differently? Or are you quite glad that it was a surprise? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, we've been, since then we have done a lot of live concert recordings, and um, and we know that we're making them now. <laughs> um, and it, it's it, it's a double edged sword because when you know you're making a recording, there's a part of you that is more cautious and more aware of all the little flaws. Where in a live performance, you can just let those things go. Um, so generally speaking, I would imagine that I would perform better in just your average mm -hmm. live concert than I might when I know that the tapes are rolling because there is just a little bit of added anxiety around that. Um, however, in the case of Daphnis, and it's such an iconic solo, and I think I just, sometimes I just zig instead of zag, you know, for fun on a given night, because I'm thinking, oh, you know, I've been, we've been doing it this way for a while, and I should, you know, I'm kind of interested in doing something else. So, you know, for something like that, I think I probably would, make sure that my interpretation was something that I <laughs> wanted to last for all of posterity instead. <laughs> and on a live performance, I might be more inclined just to toss out a, you know, slightly mm -hmm. alter alternate one every once in a while. So um, I think I probably would have preferred to know in that case, but you know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, we have a question <laughs> from Sam and he asks, what personality traits do you view as necessary or essential to su succeed in the classical music industry? Oh, that's a big question. Um, well, resilience, <laughs> because um, we resilience and flexibility and um, courage. Um, I think the ability to simultaneously be able to look really clearly at yourself and your artistry and your craft and see it for what it is um, in an effort to continually grow and improve is 
really essential and to thrive with that kind of way of being in the world, we also need to have the ability to appreciate ourselves, to be kind to ourselves, to, um, and then to sort of believe in ourselves too, to believe in our own artistic voice. So I, I feel like there's this constant balance and this tension between striving to improve, striving to become better at your art and your craft, and also learning how to stand in your own voice and say, this is what I believe in. This is how I want the music to be. This is what I want it to sound like. There's a, a balance between leadership and flexibility. There's a balance between, um, uh, you know, the right amount of confidence that enables you to project something that is full of assuredness and conviction and also maintaining an open mind and open ears so that you can be inspired by something new and different. So um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of um, kind of yes and uh, <laughs> qualities, yes, this and that. And um, I think maybe that's, that's what it is. It's being able to do these almost seemingly opposing things at the same time, all the time throughout our whole career that, that enables a musician to both be a great artist and a happy and healthy human being at the same time. Yeah. Can I add a little extra question onto that one, actually? Do you think there are any um, personality traits as a female musician that are needed in addition to any of those um, in this industry? Great question. Um, I think that it depends on the, the position that you're filling, the position that you hold, um, if it's a leadership position or not. I think that as we have seen in lots of cases, um, you know, we still as a society are less comfortable with women in leadership roles than we are with men. Um, and that's not a conscious choice for many of us. It's just, an, it's just, a, it's just one of the many kinds of um, unconscious, subconscious, implicit biases that we all have. So we see it in, in lots of leadership um, positions, if it's in other industries, if it's in politics, if it's um, certainly with on the podium with conductors. Mm -hmm. um, so usually the higher up the leadership position, the more challenging it becomes to fill that role as a woman um, comfortably because we as a whole aren't comfortable with that. So um, I think that I often will advise and, you know, I, I I, I have mixed feelings about this because I kind of wish that I didn't find myself in this position of advising younger women when they start leadership roles to, you know, carry themselves with a little extra, like double the authority and extra, you know, seriousness and maybe think with more care about your choices of how you speak and how you dress and all of that. And it really pains me to think that that's something that even needs to be discussed. Um, and I, again, I sort of struggle with whether or not I want to kind of pretend that this is not reality and move us past it or acknowledge that this is reality and, and try to help people develop some tools to deal with reality as it is now, and then hopefully change things in the future so that there's a, so that we have a, a, a broader and more flexible and richer understanding of what leadership can look like and that it can look like a bunch of different things depending on who's filling that that role. Fantastic, thank you. Um, our next question is from Andy and he says, you've mentioned in the past about the Boston Symphony Orchestra's history of progressive with its introduction of the screened auditions in the 1950s and its appointment of Dorrit as principal flute in 1952. Do you still consider this progressiveness to be part of the Boston Symphony Orchestra's identity? And how do you think other orchestras can follow suit? I think that, you know, each orchestra in this country is finding their path. As far as this goes, um, the New York Philharmonic just ran a really marvelous pro program of commissioning works by women composers. Um, they commissioned, I think, nearly 20 work, uh, new new pieces written by women composers. The Los Angeles Philharmonic had a, you know, some of these are um, projects that I'm not sure if they've been completed because of the pandemic, but the Los Angeles Philharmonic had a really 
ambitious program to reorient at least one or two seasons of theirs away from traditional Western European music, what we consider the sort of, you know, the, the, the staples of, of our, of our repertoire into, um, uh, Latin America and Asia and to reorient the kind of the, the center of their programming for a couple of seasons that way. So there've been some really big ambitious projects that are starting to happen in some of the major orchestras in this country. Um, and, you know, I think I'm really interested and exciting to see what comes next because I, I think that, for example, with what we're doing right now with the Boston Symphony, the kind of programming that we're putting out in this pandemic is a little richer and more interesting and more imaginative because we've been forced into being more creative with our limited um, choices available. Um, because of the pandemic, we've, we've actually done some really creative stuff. So um, I think this is gonna be it. I'm, I'm optimistic this is a time of some fertile growth and thinking outside of the box um, necessarily because it's time that we do. Um, and that the pandemic has kind of prompted this from from all of these different orchestras. So I'll, I think the the jury is still out on the whole industry and we'll we'll wait and see where we where we go. But I think a lot of us are are pointed in the right direction. Yeah. Um, we have a, another question from Lucy. Uh, she says, now that you've had the chance to be on the other side of the screen, what positive attributes may stand out for you from the musicians that you hear? That's such a great question. And it's so hard when you are taking auditions to have any concept of what is communicating through the screen, because it seems so abstract and it's just almost impossible to understand what it, the experience of being on the committee is like until you've had the chance to do that. So um, it, we focus so much on all of the um, technical aspects of an audition, intonation, rhythm, sound quality, articulation, technique, you know, the fingers, um, all of that. And what I, what, what's so interesting when you're sitting on the other side of the screen is that those aspects, we notice them only when they go awry. We notice them when there's an issue with those things because they're a distraction, right? Something is out of tune, is something, is out of rhythm by that. But we don't actually listen for those things. Mm -hmm. um, what we want to hear is something that carries us away artistically, that transports us, first of all, into the music that you're playing, into the piece that you're playing, because you're playing a tiny little snippet of, an, of a larger piece. So if somebody comes and they are playing brahms and you suddenly feel yourself immersed in bronze and you could hear the orchestra and you can hear those waves of sound, that's what we experience on with the great audition on the other side of the screen. And then when the interpretation that we're hearing is something that feels both like Brahms and like a, a, a really compelling artistic voice coming from that player, it's that's thrilling and that's compelling. And so that's what we are waiting for when we're on the audition committee. We're waiting to be transported in that way, carried away in that way. Um, and so, you know, it's so hard when you're preparing for an audition because it is essential that you get all of those technical aspects in place so that they don't distract. Mm -hmm. But then there needs to be this powerful artistic expression and sense of the totality of the music that's going on. And that's what actually, that's what carries the day with the committee. And that's when you sit on the committee and you hear that and you think, oh, this is just, you know, you think I want to hear more of this. This is what I want to hear more of. And that's when magic can happen. And so it's, you know, it's just, it's a hard, hard um, process to go through. Taking an audition has so little to do with playing the actual job. Um, it's a separate skill and it's, it's, a, it's important to, to learn it obviously, because that's the route to a job, but um, it can feel like a mystery, I think, when you're taking auditions. So when you um, auditioned for the Boston Symphony, had you sat behind on the audition panel at your previous orchestras? Yes, I had once or twice in one of my in one of my other previous orchestras. Um, and, you know, the other thing that you also learn when you sit on a panel is you learn the enormous diversity of opinion that exists in on audition panels, enormous diversity of opinion. And so that also helps for the times that the audition doesn't go your way. 
and it, you know sometimes it's easy to think that that verdict is some kind somehow you know set in stone and it's final and it's the truth about your playing and it the the number of decisions that are made on a splitting a hair and you know one different person on the audition panel and it would have gone a completely different way it's 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 also really hard you know it, it it's it's kind of stunning how i think i guess the thing that i walk away from it thinking is how lucky i am to have won any audition at all <laughs> and how many things have to go right both for the performer and all the other things that have to go right in order for it to end up working out in the end um, we have another question from Paul, and he says, who has been your biggest musical inspiration and why? This is a hard question. I almost feel like this is in the same question of what's your favorite piece to play, because there's a handful and there's many of them. Um, and it's a nice question because you get to think about all these glorious, great artists and, and um, I, you know, I would say that as far as, the way I approach the instrument and the way I approach music, it would be my teacher, Jim Walker, who I studied with um, in my undergrad, who really kind of laid the foundation for me for how to be a musician and also um, some bigger picture things also about being a colleague, about being um, about all of that. But, but then beyond that, I think, I'm going to give an answer that sounds boring because it's kind of a non-answer, but I, I genuinely pick up inspiration from little tidbits of things that I hear all the time from my colleagues on stage, especially from guest artists and soloists a lot from singers a lot. Um, I love to think about how a voice would do something and how a great singer would, would inflect something or how a great singer would travel between two notes or um, the way a voice can you know, express warmth or the way singers breathe and how the breathing is part of, especially as flutists, because we have to breathe all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's easy to feel bad about that, but the way the singers can incorporate a breath into their, into the music in a way that feels so right. Um, so, so I guess I don't point to any one individual artist or soloist or, or musician, but I, I just find myself inspired and it can sometimes just be by just simply a particular interval that someone plays that I think is ex exquisite. And I just pick that up routinely. I think we have time for one last question. Um, and that's another one from Arthur. And he says, if you could start again, would you still choose to play the flute or what other instrument would appeal to you and why? Oh, great question. Well, I do love the flute. I also really love the cello. And I think the best job in the orchestra is the English horn. I think the English horn is the money job in the orchestra. It's so fabulous because really they play all the juicy solos, lyrical <laughs> solos all the time. It's such a rich, it's in such a beautiful register. Um, you know, that. I guess they don't get to play any Beethoven or Mozart, so that would really be sort of sad. But I think that it's really it is a, it's a great it's a great position to have in the orchestra. But I'm pretty happy as a as a as a as a flutist. Are there any things that you wish the flute could do that you feel like it, it's more difficult for on this instrument? I wish we could you know slide between notes like string <laughs> players can you know or, and singers can too, right? Tastefully, tastefully done. You know, it's a, it's a thing of beauty when it when it's tasteful and just and subtle. I try to do it. Um, I'm working on it. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, I think that's probably all we've got time for today. So thank you very much, Elizabeth, for all of your advice um, and for answering all of those questions. Uh, it's been really brilliant to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been a joy. And thank you to everybody who's been watching. I'll see you all again soon. <laughs>